Let's talk about the repentance of dead works. Over in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, it states, Wherefore, leaving the beginning word of the Christ, we should carry along or bear along on the basis of the maturity, not again laying down a foundation of the changing of the mind from dead works and faith concerning God, doctrine of immersion, laying on of hands, both resurrection from the dead and eternal judgment. As we mature in our Christian life, we're going to be training our senses to be able to discern what is proper and what is wrong. And of course, in doing this, we're going to go on to maturity. We're going to leave the basics or the principal things. The basic things have to do with the changing of the mind, which is repentance. We start our Christian life out by believing that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day. We see this over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Now, prior to believing this, it was not something that our mind was focused on. So we had to change our mind when presented with the facts. Upon that repentance, we were actually saved. When scripture talks about repentance, this is what it's talking about. A changing of the mind in relation to the facts of the gospel. And this saves us. Along with this, we then turn from dead works because we begin to understand that works related to the law have no value in our righteousness. Our righteousness is because of what Christ has done, not what we do. In addition, dead works could never actually deal with the conscience issue. That is, work under law could never deal with an issue that is brought about by sin in the mind. However, that is completely different when it comes to the blood of Christ because his blood actually cleanses our conscience from dead works. So it's through the blood of Christ that our conscience can be cleansed. And the work we do is because of who we are in Christ, not trying to please God or show him how righteous we are through our own works. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 says, How much more the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself spotless to God, will cleanse our conscience from dead works unto religious service of the living God. We should also be moving on from the doctrine of immersion. Now, immersion, of course, we know that as baptism, has to do with cleaning our conscience, and it's something that is from the beginning. We are immersed or we are baptized once. You see this over in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 22, that it talks about dealing with our conscience has nothing to do with salvation. Who is now an antitype, which is talking about Noah and how he was actually saved through water. Who is now an antitype, and we are saved by immersion, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but a good conscience answering unto God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In addition, we move on from the laying on of hands. And the laying on of hands has to do with the acceptance of the Gentiles by the Jews. We see this especially as the apostles begin to go out from Jerusalem into Samaria and they lay their hands upon the Samaritans. That was a big thing because they were beginning to understand that God was doing something different and he was dealing with both Jew and Gentile. Remember in Christ, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. Where under the law, there was a very clear distinction. We see this in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11, where it says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. And also in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28, where it says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And they began to understand that, and now we need to move away from that, because in Christ, we have equality. That is, both races have been brought together. God took down the dividing wall. And then we have moving on from the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. We will be resurrected like Christ. And that's something that we, from the very beginning, should understand. Because since that is the state that we will ultimately be in, our life should begin to manifest that. See over in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2 where it talks about that. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but, when, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
In addition, over in John chapter 5 and verse 24, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes on him who sent me has everlasting life. That would actually be eternal life. And shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. But yet those who actually reject God will face judgment. And scripture is very clear on that. John chapter 16 in verse 8 talks about the fact that the Holy Spirit has come to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And judgment because the ruler of this age has actually been judged. And you see that in verse 11. In addition, over in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46, we see that there are those who will go to everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto eternal life. With understanding this, that we as Christians should grow and we should mature. We don't want to stay with the beginning things. We want to understand the deep things of God. The deep things related to who we are in Christ and how to live out this life that God has actually given to us. Let's go on from these beginning principles and begin to experientially know God. Know him through living out who we are in Christ by using what he has provided for us, by understanding our position before him and our possessions, by knowing who he is, growing and maturing in a way to where we actually feel comfortable with what God says about us. And we're no longer comfortable living in relation to the sin nature. We're no longer comfortable manifesting the things that we used to manifest, which were unrighteousness or being in the darkness. We become comfortable with walking in the light, manifesting things as they truly are. That's how we as Christians should be. Because when we're doing this, we have victory over our sin nature. We're no longer a slave to unrighteousness. As a matter of fact, we become a slave to righteousness. That means the predominant type of action in our life is righteous, glorifies God, presents a proper opinion of who he is and takes full advantage of this incredible salvation that he has so graciously provided for us.